so this chapter deals with various interpretive methods that we can use to understand visual works of art. Um, we can use a combination of different methods. We can use description, analysis, and critique, all to understand the appearance, the meaning, or the content of a work of art. We've already established that art is a form of visual language, and just like a verbal language is communicated through vocabulary and grammar, visual artists rely on the visual vocabulary and rules that are sort of similar to grammar uh, to create their works of art. And so we call those the elements and principles of art, which is what this whole first section has been dedicated to. Um, so a formal analysis is basically a visual study of a work of art that includes a very careful description of what it looks like and of the elements and principles that are involved. How has the artist used this visual language to create a final work of art? Examining the relationships between or the arrangements of the visual elements and principles of an artwork can really help us to analyze and understand its content. Um, a work of art is really a product of a very dynamic interrelationship between the various art elements and principles. And so to understand, we really need to understand the language that's being used by the artist and how they have applied the elements and principles to a particular work. Um, so to analyze a work of art fully and formally, we really need to describe in specific detail how each element and principle is utilized within it and what effect that creates um, for the overall work. The first phase of a formal analysis is the observation phase. So during this phase, you're going to be looking very closely at your chosen work of art to identify the visual attributes that are working within it. Um, you want to try to describe them carefully and accurately but using your own words. Um, and keep in mind, this is not a research paper, so you're not going to be reading about the artwork really at all. Um, this observation phase is all about looking and thinking and finding your own language to kind of communicate what you see and what you um, interpret based on what you see. So this is all about trusting your eyes and kind of following um, your own curiosity. You're going to spend some time looking at your work of art. Um, take some notes, try to observe it from close up and from far away if possible. Um, focus on the work as a whole, but also try to focus on the details, which ones pop out at you. Um, take some notes while you're doing these observations, and then later when we reach the, um, the next phase, those notes will be helpful. You can kind of refer back to them. The first phase of a formal analysis is the observation phase. So during this phase, you're going to be looking very closely at your chosen work of art to identify the visual attributes that are working within it. Um, you want to try to describe them carefully and accurately but using your own words. Um, and keep in mind, this is not a research paper, so you're not going to be reading about the artwork really at all. Um, this observation phase is all about looking and thinking and finding your own language to kind of communicate what you see and what you um, interpret based on what you see. So this is all about trusting your eyes and kind of following um, your own curiosity. You're going to spend some time looking at your work of art. Um, take some notes, try to observe it from close up and from far away if possible. Um, focus on the work as a whole, but also try to focus on the details, which ones pop out at you. Um, take some notes while you're doing these observations, and then later when we reach the, um, the next phase, those notes will be helpful. You can kind of refer back to them. The first phase of a formal analysis is the observation phase. So during this phase, you're going to be looking very closely at your chosen work of art to identify the visual attributes that are working within it. 
Um, you want to try to describe them carefully and accurately but using your own words. Um, and keep in mind, this is not a research paper, so you're not going to be reading about the artwork really at all. Um, this observation phase is all about looking and thinking and finding your own language to kind of communicate what you see and what you um, interpret based on what you see. So this is all about trusting your eyes and kind of following um, your own curiosity. You're going to spend some time looking at your work of art. Um, take some notes. Try to observe it from close up and from far away if possible. Um, focus on the work as a whole, but also try to focus on the details, which ones pop out at you. Um, take some notes while you're doing these observations, and then later when we reach the um, the next phase, those notes will be helpful. You can kind of refer back to them. Phase two is the analysis phase. So now you're going to be thinking about your observations and trying to transform them into statements about the work of art. Um, you're trying to use your observations as evidence to make an argument for a certain interpretation of the work or a certain meaning, things like that. Uh, you want to think about how the specific visual elements and principles that you've identified, how they come together to create the whole artwork, and what effect that whole artwork has on the viewer. Consider things like how your eye is led through the work and why. Um, consider the choices that the artist has made in creating this work and the effect that those choices have on the viewer. Um, and remember that there's still no research or reading about the work of art during this phase. Um, you can explore very basic information, such as the title or the materials used to create the artwork, um, which is often available on the label um, that is presented with the work in the museum or the gallery. Um, but this is not a research paper. Again, this is about your ability to make observations and then to transform those observations into um, interpretation or to argument. So for example, let's look at this work by the artist Otto Dix, Reclining Woman on a Leopard Skin. This is an oil painting from 1927. Um, and so our first phase is going to be observation. Um, so spend some time kind of looking at the work and making these observations, and then we'll sort of transition that into an analysis. So first start by looking at the painting, take some notes, maybe pause the video here to take some of your own notes before listening to the rest of my analysis. Um, but you'll begin with note taking, asking yourself some general questions. So maybe things like, what is the subject of this picture? Um, and so it might be helpful to write down everything that you see. So in this case, you see a reclining woman in a dress. Uh, she's wearing stockings. She's laying on a leopard fur. And there are a couple different types of textiles around her. There is a snarling dog-like animal in the frame as well. Um, and it looks like maybe wood flooring is visible in the far right of the painting. Now, another approach here could be to ask yourself, what is your initial reaction to this work of art? When you first look at it, do you find it intimidating, intriguing? Maybe you find it weird, or maybe you find it appealing or pretty. Um, why? Why is that your first interpretation? Um, what are the things that you notice first about this work of art, and why? For example, I notice that the face shape here, um, or excuse me, the face is in very sharp detail. Um, and that she is kind of looking at the viewer very directly, kind of confronting us head on. Um, I also notice a contrast between the dark lipstick color and the light value of her skin and how her hand is kind of framing her face from beneath as it supports her chin to sort of give it further emphasis. Now, we can also think about whether a narrative or a story is being depicted here, um, even if we don't know what that would be immediately. Now, looking at this painting, there's no evident storyline, um, but maybe think about what the artist is focusing on instead. Now, after you've asked these questions, you should be able to kind of ascertain your first impressions, the areas of the work that you find most striking, and maybe the basic subject matter of the work. 
So in this case, I'm sort of surmising that the woman is likely the subject of the painting based on how much room she takes up, and that this is likely a portrait of an actual woman rather than a symbol or an allegory because of the visual emphasis, emphasis excuse me, visual emphasis um, that's given to her sort of odd, individualized or specific facial features. Now, after you've made kind of some initial observations, you can move on to the specific visual qualities that you observe in the painting and kind of consider them one by one. Now, I'm going to go through some examples here, but keep in mind, when you're looking at a work of art, you won't necessarily need to cover each and every element or principle. Um, and also keep in mind that for the sake of time, I'm kind of combining the phases of observation and analysis in these um, examples. But understand that you should really give a lot of time to each step individually. Um, don't rush into analysis before you've dedicated a good amount of time to observation. <clears throat> now, one thing that we might consider when we're looking at this is style. Do the things that appear in this painting appear as we would see them in real life, or have they been stylized? Um, I would say that most of this painting is rather realistic, although there are some elements that seem stylized, such as maybe her facial features. I also noticed that the artist has deliberately posed her so that she appears to have um, no neck. Her arm sort of disappears into the leopard fur and kind of seems cut off. And then her hand especially seems almost dismembered or detached to this hand that's kind of laying across the leopard skin here. <clears throat> so an analysis based on these observations might suggest to me that the painter was reliant on visual reality, but they also took opportunities to sort of heighten the viewer's response and emotions by including these stylistic changes and kind of visual exaggerations. Another element we could talk about here is color. Um, the most common colors in this painting seem to be green, red, white, and brown. Um, I do notice that there seems to be a lot of contrast between red, which is a warm color, and green, which is a cool color. Um, and that extends, you know, even into her face and her skin here. I'm also seeing contrasts between dark and light. Um, her face or her body versus the materials that are on or around her. Each of these contrasts gives the work more drama and more energy. Um, and that can be discussed in the analysis of the work. If I try to read color more symbolically, I could note that in Western representations, so in European or American representations, which this artist is a German artist, um, red is often associated with passion or sex or love. And we do have this reclining woman um, with the garter on her leg in sort of a provocative position. Um, but red is also associated with blood and danger. So maybe that would connect with the snarling animal that's seen in the background. Um, but formally, I might simply know that contrasting colors like red and green tend to make each other kind of pop visually. They intensify each other, right? And so the artist here is very likely using these purposefully, kind of combining those two contrasting colors um, to intensify the composition as a whole. Now we can also consider line. There are contrasts in line here as well. Um, we have smooth curves around her lower body, especially around the hips and the thighs, which could potentially connote a sort of conventionally feminine idea. Um, but there are also very angular lines around her face, her jaw, her fingers and shoulders, um, which possibly read as more conventionally masculine. Her head and her face are full of strong lines in her cheeks and her jaw, um, though her eyes also seem somewhat exaggerated, um, kind of curved like almonds, uh, somewhat like cat's eyes, um, which maybe connects to the leopard skin, um, or even to the creature in the background as well. Now, there's no literal texture in this painting since it's a two-dimensional uh, oil painting on a wood panel. However, the artist has tried um, quite hard to create the illusion of texture. 
we have the leopard's fur, we have the velvet-like materials of the other textiles, um, the stockings, the dress, the woman's hair, the fur of the snarling animal. All of these are suggestive of touch or um, maybe inviting to the touch, um, or at least suggesting some sort of potential tactility. Um, if you survive the attempt that is trying to pet that snarling creature in the background. Um, but these textures maybe also suggest a sense of luxury um, or maybe even costumery because she has on this kind of um, fanciful evening wear. But she is reclining on a bed that has these sort of luxurious textiles and cushions. Um, all of this sort of suggests both visual and material richness. Now, what about space? Space in this painting seems somewhat tight, kind of uh, crowded, perhaps. There are multiple areas of the work, um, including the fact that her lower legs are cropped out in the picture, um, that sort of seem to push her forward toward the viewer, um, kind of bringing her closer to us in the foreground of the painting. Notice how little space remains between her elbow and her knees um, and then the edge of the painting at the bottom, whereas how um, there really seems to be more room in the background, kind of behind the woman between her and that curtain in the background, although that's sort of hidden um, with the dark shadows and the dark green cloth. Now, we can also think about space in another way and consider where exactly is she? Um, is this a bedroom, a hotel? Um, are there any clues here that help kind of help us to figure this out? It seems that she's on a bed, but is that true? Um, is the viewer supposed to be on this large bed with her? Um, it's just as important to sort of observe what is left unresolved or what is unknowable from an observation. Um, maybe that will give the work a sense of mystery, or maybe it will simply help us to better understand what is present and why it is present. Now let's consider the composition as a whole. So how are the visual elements of the work arranged? Do they seem balanced? Is there one focus or does your eye move around the painting in a particular way? One way to help ascertain this is to sort of imagine a vertical line dividing the left and right halves of the painting and another one that divides the top half from the bottom half. So in the first instance, we can see um, the same things we observed before, a balance of objects, but contrast in colored line. Um, Maybe we can see the relationships to traditional gender representation. Um, note that the snarling animal kind of balances out the head and face of the woman, which is potentially the artist's way of bringing them into comparison with each other. Um, further giving this female subject animalistic attributes and kind of emphasizing her alert, fixed gaze on the viewer. Um, her right arm is poised as if she is perhaps about to pounce, whereas the lower half suggests um, more response or at least lets the viewer look at her without direct confrontation. Um, the top and bottom are not balanced because she occupies all of the bottom, whereas a good amount of the top half is empty. But why? Um, how does your eye move around this work? Where do you start and how are you encouraged to look? Or maybe how are you encouraged not to look? Um, and we can also consider scale. Is the work life size, smaller, larger? How does that impact the viewer's relationship to the artwork? In this case, the sitter might be slightly smaller than life size, but not by much. And the height of the painting from the ground puts her eyes across from hers, which really heightens the sense of confrontation. Now that we've made all of these observations, start considering how the visual elements that we have observed, how they work together and what effect that combination has on the viewer. So again, it might be helpful here to think about how your eye is moved around the work and why. 
Um, this is, of course, not the only image of a woman reclining that you have seen before, um, be that in art or in advertising. Um, this one is perhaps similar or different um, to others that you've seen. Um, consider the artist's decision making as well as the visual elements that um, he's incorporated here. Is this a portrait, a flattering one, or no? Um, did the sitter actually look like this and would it matter if she did or didn't? How does the artist depict her and why? Is the title of the work helpful at all? Um, why did he not use the actual name of the reclining woman in the title? Um, you'll also want to pull on those observations of style, color, line, texture, space, scale, composition. Use all of those here as evidence to draw conclusions about the artwork. Now, you're not going to be able to answer all of your questions definitively from merely observing the artwork, but you can start to make some claims and kind of craft an argument and start to understand how the artwork operates formally, uh, given the visual evidence that you've compiled. So once you have um, sort of completed the observation and analysis phase, Start formulating your argument. You're going to want a main thesis claim uh, that tries to present your argument um, and that gives an idea of how you will support that argument or it explains it with your own observations. So for example, a sample thesis statement regarding this particular work of art might be, um, in his painting, Reclining Woman on a Leopard Skin from 1927, Otto Dix uses visual contrasts and implied textures to create a provocative and vivid portrait of the sitter that exudes personality and glamour. Uh, so that statement tells us the subject of this argument, uh, the painting Reclining Woman on a Leopard Skin by Otto Dix. Um, it tells us the observations, or at least some of the observations we've made, um, how he uses visual contrasts and implied textures. And it also tells us the effect or the result of those decisions. Um, the decisions to use visual contrasts and implied textures create a provocative and vivid portrait of the sitter that exudes personality and glamour. Um, and so if we were going to write a formal analysis paper, we would continue on through our paragraphs kind of explaining how um, this painting has visual contrasts, how it has implied textures, and how those things uh, create a provocative and vivid portrait of the sitter here. So another way that we can try to interpret visual works of art is through stylistic analysis. So artworks have style or specific characteristics that make them look the way that they do. Um, style is the characteristic ways in which an artist or maybe a group of artists uses the visual language of elements and principles um, to create an identifiable form of visual expression or to create a work of art. Um, so style, these characteristics help us to recognize that an artwork was made by a particular artist or maybe that it was made during a certain period of time or in a certain region. Um, groups of artists may share styles because they use similar techniques or maybe because they studied under the same teacher or they lived in the same area. Um, but the characteristics that contribute to style include the use of formal elements, the use of design principles, and the level of abstraction or representation that is used. Um, style can relate to brush strokes or the marks an artist makes, uh, the ways in which light shines brightly in one part of the picture and the way that the rest of the picture is in darkness. All of these things um, sort of sort of relate to the style of an artwork. So for example, 
let's look at these two works from the European Renaissance. So the Renaissance occurred in Europe between about 1400 and 1600. And so the term Renaissance really means rebirth and it's referencing this renewed interest in the classical world of ancient Greece and Rome. Now we see the influence of classical subject matter in visual arts um, through the large number of nudes and mythological figures that are depicted in particularly Italian Renaissance art. Um, however, we also see classical subjects um, that have been sort of infused with Christian um, messages or maybe just Christian subjects that have replaced those classical ones. Um, now, there are differences in the styles of art that were created during the Renaissance, depending on the location. So the two examples that we see here are roughly contemporary to one another. They were made within about 10 years of each other. We've got the Italian artist Masaccio. Um, this is his fresco titled Trinity from about 1425 or 26. Um, and then we have the Northern Renaissance artist, Jean van Eyck. Um, he was from Flanders, I believe. Um, this is his Arnolfini portrait from 1434, and it is an oil on canvas. And so these two works are both very nice examples of the stylistic characteristics um, that are evident in Italian Renaissance art and Northern Renaissance art. Um, so both of them come out of the Renaissance, and both of them are sort of touching on similar ideas in some ways, but looking at them together like this, you can automatically tell that they look different. Uh, so let's talk about why. Both Italian Renaissance artists and Northern European Renaissance artists um, were interested in classical subject matter. Um, and that is evident in the number of nude figures and mythological figures that are seen in the artworks of this era. Um, usually nudes and mythological figures uh, were more prominently made by Italian artists, um, although both Italians and Northern Europeans also incorporated um, Christian messages and subject matter as well. Now, Northern Renaissance artists tended to prefer to depict clothed religious or everyday figures, um, whereas the nude figure was much more common in Italy. Um, we also see oil paint being used primarily in the Northern European regions, whereas fresco remains very popular in Italy. Um, and then we'll also see that <clears throat> Northern Renaissance imagery often includes more intimate scenes and more intricate details. Um, they tend to focus on um, illusionistic textural details and just very kind of minuscule uh, details of the scene. Um, and they try to sort of promote this personal interaction with artwork, whereas the Italian artists uh, frequently created frescoes that were quite often depicting grand scale imagery um, and promoting maybe saints or other intermediaries, people who sort of act as interpreters or go-betweens, um, which in this case, uh, they would be go-betweens between the ordinary people and between God. Um, so part of the stylistic differences here, in Italy we have the Catholic Church um, promoting their idea of a relationship with God, which was all about the church or the, the pope or the priest, whoever, serving as the intermediary between regular people and God, whereas in Northern Europe, the Protestants believed that a more personal, direct relationship between a person and God was achievable. Um, and so <clears throat> some of these stylistic differences link back to those religious beliefs. During the Renaissance, there was also the development of um, a philosophy known as humanism. 
this is kind of a philosophy that stressed the study of the classical world and promoted uh, the success of individuals as a reflection of their gifts from God. Um, the humanist philosophy is you know, all about focusing on individual achievement and earthly naturalism. Yes, we can still be kind of dedicated to religious worship or to um, spirituality, but it's also about recognizing um, the natural experience of humanity in reality, what it really means to be a human or what it's really like to be a human. Um, and so following this renewed interest in both you know, the classical past and this influence of humanist thought, Italian artists during the early Renaissance were really preoccupied with making images that their viewers would believe um, entirely to be real. Although they did seek to sort of balance the real with the ideal, um, especially when subjects were religious or mythological. And so whereas during the Middle Ages, depictions of the nude body had been avoided other than to show weakness or mortality of sinners like Adam and Eve, um, during the Italian Renaissance, artists portrayed the idealized nude figure as being the embodiment of spiritual and intellectual perfection. And so in art, although religious subjects were still very popular, the emphasis sort of switched from a belief in faith as the only factor in attaining immortality after death to a concentration on how human actions could enhance the quality of life on Earth. Um, <clears throat> we also see mathematics and science derived from a renewed study of classical Greek and Roman works um, being used to sort of encourage the systematic understanding of the world. So Renaissance artists in Italy in particular used and refined new, excuse me, new systems of perspective to sort of translate their careful observations more consistently into realistic artistic representations. So for example, on the left here, we have Masaccio's Trinity, as I said before. Um, so this depicts the Holy Trinity. We have Christ on the cross, um, positioned just in front of God the Father, who stands behind. Um, and then between their two heads, we have a small white dove, which is representative of the Holy Spirit. So that is our Holy Trinity, right? Um, and so this fresco is at the Santa Maria Novella in Florence. Um, and so the goal here. Masaccio's goal was to create a monumental yet consistently scaled scene that was reasonably believable or convincing as an architectural space. Um, so this is a fresco painting, meaning that it's painted directly on the wall. And so the goal that the artist wanted to achieve here was that the viewer would walk up to this fresco painting and feel as if they were really looking into this recessed barrel vaulted niche within the wall as if this were a true space that you know had depth and that these figures could stand within and so he's using <clears throat> excuse me he's using stylistic characteristics from the italian renaissance to do this he's using uh, linear perspective he has situated the horizon line um, rather low in this particular work, uh, right along the, the kind of bottom here, uh, kind of giving attention to the height of the average viewer so that the horizon line falls at their eye level. And then all of our orthogonal lines sort of converge downward to that horizon line to suggest that we have this sense of depth or space. And then he's also incorporating <clears throat> overlapping of forms and figures to suggest depth and space. And he's incorporating um, chiaroscuro, kind of the shading, um, or rather using the gradual kind of changes from light to dark or from light to shadow to suggest three dimensionality and volume to suggest that these figures are truly occupying this space. I think Christ's figure, the abdomen there is maybe the most evident of this volume. Um, you know, we have this sense of 
his body weight kind of pulling against his arms as he hangs on the cross there because of how um, the shadows have been used to kind of create the dips in the abdomen um, to create the muscles here. Now, on the other hand, the Renaissance that took place in Northern Europe, in the Netherlands, in Germany, France, Belgium, um, this is quite different from the developments we see in Italy. So <clears throat> unlike early Italian Renaissance artists, the Northern Renaissance artists were less concerned with idealized figures and precise perspectives um, and more concerned with expressing their uh, messages through symbolism. Um, artists in the northern countries are typically known for their skilled use of oil paint as opposed to the more common use of fresco or tempera in Italy. Um, and so while a fresco painting has to be completed quickly, the slow drying process of oil paint really allowed the artists to create very fine details and um, illusionistic textures in their works. Um, so this particular work, Jean van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait, is a wonderful example. Jean van Eyck, um, he's sometimes credited with the development of oil painting, although he's actually just one of the earliest, um, most prominent users of the material. He really popularizes it. But um, here you can see that kind of richness of the oil paint of those colors and how the artist has really used this technique of glazing, um, kind of using thin, almost transparent layers of paint, kind of building them up to achieve this richness of color, of texture, and kind of imply volume and form um, through the use of subtle changes in value and hue. Um, but this is also a lovely example of how in the Northern Renaissance, it was very common to infuse works of art with um, religious meaning. Instead of trying to convey meaning through mythological subjects, as was often the practice in Italy, uh, northern artists depicted people from everyday life and incorporate, um, you know, intricate details with very, um, very thorough symbolic meaning to communicate the content of their work. Um, so, for example, the Arnolfini portrait here, um, this has been a source of mystery for scholars for several generations. Um, we have an intimate kind of domestic scene, this young couple in a room um, in which, you know, this room is painted in such detail that the viewer maybe feels as if we're looking into a real room with real people inside of it. Yeah. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. It only seems that way because of how kind of intricately detailed um, all of the forms and figures are within this work. So, for example, notice um, the very illusionistic textures of the fabrics. The man is wearing this heavy kind of velvety cloth cloak uh, trimmed with soft fur. Uh, the woman also wears sort of a heavy crushed velvet dress. Notice how it implies this sense of weight as it kind of crumples on top of itself. Um, you can also see kind of the individual hairs of this dog's fur really sort of conveying this sense of maybe a, a coarse wiry coat. Um, we have relatively natural proportions and perspectives here. It may not be, you know, perfectly accurate, but it's accurate enough that it is convincing. And the details of this room, again, make it seem like it is a real room. Um, and so it sort of it sort of conveys that sense of reality, yet not quite in the same idealized way um, that Italians often did. So I mentioned that 
Northern Renaissance artists often infused um, a large amount of religious symbolism into their works. Um, so we'll continue to look at Jean Venet's Arnolfini portrait here um, as we start talking about iconographic analysis. Um, so iconography is the study of subject matter, um, the study of the visual images and symbols that are used in a work of art. Iconology is the study and interpretation of the meaning of that subject matter. Um, in an artwork, specifically, such as the signs or the symbols that maybe reflect the religious, historical, or cultural context of the work. So an iconographic analysis can help us determine what the conventional meanings of the subject matter um, are. We can determine if the figures have specific identities or if the objects shown have symbolic or allegorical meanings in addition to their natural um, subject matter. An iconographical analysis identifies the natural subject matter by recognizing forms and situations that we're familiar with based on our own experiences, and it interprets the work of art as an embodiment of its cultural situation to help place it within a broad social, political, religious, or intellectual context. Um, art is made by people, and people are influenced by a plethora of particulars the time period, the location, the race or gender, class, sexuality, religious or political affiliation of the artist, um, all of that is going to affect the art that they make. So context is very important to interpreting and understanding a work of art. When we know about the context in which the work was made, we can learn more about it. And so iconography and iconology are often highly dependent on context. They may not always be apparent to the viewer with an, if they don't have an understanding of the context in which the work was made. Um, so, so with this work, we have an intimate domestic scene with a young couple holding hands in this uh, rather luxurious bedroom. Now, we don't know exactly who the individuals in this picture are for certain. However, original scholarship identified them as being Giovanni and Giovanna Arnolfini. Uh, Giovanni, the man, was a very wealthy banker, and Giovanna Arnolfini was also from a socially prominent family. Um, and so they were married. Um, and an art historian named Erwin Panofsky in 1934 um, he did this very intense study of the culture in which this artwork was made. Uh, so um, the culture of Northern Europe, particularly the Netherlands um, in this period of time. And based on the, you know, the findings, he argued that there were numerous objects in this painting that had symbolic meanings that had been lost to modern viewers and that you know, based on those meanings, this painting can be interpreted as um, an image about the sacramental nature of marriage. Um, so, for example, we have these two, you know, two figures holding hands, and um, there are various objects around them that have symbolic meaning. So, these symbolisms would have been probably pretty evident to contemporary viewers, to viewers um, who were looking at this painting in, in 1434 when it was originally created. For example, the shoes on the left and then again in the back behind the couple can be interpreted as having been taken off because the ground is considered sacred. Um, if a person is standing on sacred or holy ground, they are meant to remove their shoes. The dog in front of the couple is traditionally interpreted as a sign of fidelity, um, of loyalty in marriage. It could also maybe be interpreted as a symbol of domesticity. Dogs are domesticated animals, um, and maybe that could relate to the idea of the domestic role that a woman plays as the wife, um, especially in this period of time. We also have a single candle 
lit within the chandelier above, which suggests unity. And then over um, near the window, we have oranges or some type of exotic fruits that are very ripe. And these are suggesting fertility, but maybe also wealth. Oranges and lemons would have been very expensive because they had to be imported. Um, and so this references the wealth of this couple, as do the other luxurious materials, such as the gold used for the chandelier or the very um, kind of <clears throat> very um, luxurious fabrics that both couples are, or excuse me, that both individuals are dressed in. Now, notice that the female figure seems to have a large abdomen that protrudes outward, maybe indicating that she is pregnant. Now, we don't know for certain if she truly would have been pregnant at the time, and therefore the artist is trying to just represent her as she really looked. Um, or perhaps he has represented her this way to sort of symbolize the hope that this newlywed couple will um, be be um, fertile and they will produce children to kind of continue their line. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but the carved wood post behind the figure here is actually carved into the figure of St. Margaret, who was the protector of women during childbirth. Um, so her inclusion perhaps supports the idea that um, the female figure is pregnant or you know, the hope that she will be pregnant and have children. Here we can zoom in just a little bit and look at a couple of more um, symbols. We've got this convex mirror shown on the back wall. Um, around the mirror, we have these little uh, roundels or these little vignettes that show scenes from the Passion of the Christ. Um, 15th century viewers would have paid very careful attention to this mirror um, and kind of sought to understand those circular miniature pictures uh, surrounding it. Um, such an object would have been very expensive and uh, a truly luxurious possession. So again, this would be to symbolize the wealth of the couple. Um, although the mirror itself sort of helps extend the illusion of reality in the painting by showing um, the reflection of the room in front of the couple, which we can't otherwise see um, in the painting itself. So in the reflection, we can see here the female and the male from the back, and then between them, there are actually two other figures. Um, now above, <clears throat> excuse me, above the mirror, we have an inscription that reads, Jeanne van Eyck was here, 1434. Um, so this is perhaps sort of the artist's signature, although um, Erwin Panofsky argues that this announces the painter's presence and suggests that he was declaring himself as one of the two witnesses um, who is visible in that in, in that mirror's reflection. Um, so he would have been one of the two witnesses for this wedding ceremony, perhaps. Uh, maybe the other figure there is the priest. Um, but then we also have um, the crystal prayer beads to the side of the mirror, which indicate the couple's um, faith or their piety. Um, we also have a broom that hangs off the corner of the bed that we can see right next to the mirror. Perhaps the broom relates to ideas of domesticity again. Um, so based on the, um, the symbolic meanings of all of these individual objects and the inclusion of the inscription, Jan van Eyck was here, um, Erwin Panofsky argued that this was um, a legal document, perhaps, a way to sort of um, record the event of this wedding ceremony. Um, to record the witnesses who were in attendance, but then the symbolic imagery also kind of enhances uh, the message and underscores the sacramental nature of marriage, the importance of fidelity and of having, um, you know, of dedicating your marriage to God and, and things like this. Now, Panofsky's iconographic analysis has for a long time been adopted as the um, as the 
sort of correct interpretation of this painting. However, recent discoveries prove that not all of his interpretations can be true. Um, so, in 1997, it was uncovered that Giovanni and Giovanna Arnolfini were not actually married until 1447, which would have been six years after the death of Van Eyck and also after this painting was completed. So the artist, therefore, could not have painted this portrait as a depiction of their wedding because he was dead. He couldn't have been there. Um, some scholars argue that maybe this was sort of a statement of the couple's intent to get married. Um, maybe this was part of the dowry that was paid or some sort of contract saying, yes, these two individuals will be married in the future. Or other scholars have proposed that perhaps this is not a depiction of Giovanni and his new wife, Giovanna, but rather Perhaps this is a depiction of Giovanni and his first wife, who had died about one year prior to the creation of this painting. And according to um, our record, she died during childbirth. So it's possible then that this is sort of a memorial to that first wife. That would explain why the woman appears to be pregnant. That would explain the presence of the carved St. Margaret figure, the protector of women during childbirth. Um, potentially, we could also then read into uh, the red color of the bedding um, as maybe blood and danger. Um, but also of love and kind of passion. <clears throat> so knowing the symbolic meanings of these objects in their original context is very important to understanding the message or the meaning of the artwork. However, we can't always develop a, um, you know, a very certain interpretation based on those things. Unfortunately, there are some instances in which we just have to say, this is our best interpretation based on the evidence, but ultimately we can't know for sure. Here we have another work that we can perform an iconographical analysis on. Um, this work is titled The Ambassadors, and it was painted by the German artist Hans Holbein in 1533 while he was working at the court of King Henry VIII of England. Um, and so this is very rich in its symbolic significance. Um, and so we can perform an iconographical analysis to really identify the broader meanings of the subject matter um, that is included in this composition based on the context of its creation. So, um, Holbein, he was working in the English court at the time, and so based on that context and based on existing research, we can identify the two individuals in this painting as Jean de Dentville and the Bishop Georges de Selve. Um, these were two Frenchmen who were serving as ambassadors to England at the time, um, and so the subject of the painting is these two individuals and sort of their their roles as ambassadors. Now in 1533 when this work was made, England was on the brink of breaking with the Catholic Church to become Protestant, and so the iconography of this work reflects that as well. So we have two shelves between the two figures here, an upper one and a lower one. The lower shelf seems to be more concerned with earthly matters. It contains both secular and religious items. We've got a globe, a hymn book, a crucifix, and a lute, and all of these carry specific religious meanings. Now again, these meanings have perhaps been lost and wouldn't necessarily be understood by the modern viewer by just a glance, but at the time this was made, contemporary viewers would have understood the symbolic meanings of these objects um, quite readily. Um, so, for example, the center of the bottom shelf depicts a globe. Um, that globe is actually turned so that Rome, Italy, is in the center, facing outward. Uh, Rome would have been the hub of the Catholic Church or the Catholic faith at the time. 
Um, the lute on this shelf has a broken string, which perhaps represents the religious discord between the Catholic faith and the Protestant Reformation. Um, the hymn book is displaying verses written by Martin Luther, the German pioneer of Protestantism. Uh, perhaps the artist included this to encourage the restoration of religious concord between these two factions. Now, the upper shelf is seemingly more symbolic of heaven, and it features devices that are used to understand the heavens, to measure time, um, and to navigate. So we have things like a celestial globe, a sundial, and compasses. Um, and so these items indicate how um, educated these men are and how well-traveled they are because of their occupation as ambassadors. Um, the sundial shows the date April 11th, 1533, which would be the date that this painting was completed. Um, and then the perhaps most symbolic image included in this painting is the large distorted skull that is in the foreground. Um, now, you may not even notice that it is a skull at first. It's sort of tilted upwards and distorted so that it is hard to kind of recognize. Um, but the skull itself is a memento mori, right? It's a symbolic reminder of human mortality or of the inevitability of death. Um, so the inclusion of the skull in general kind of tells us that despite the ambassador's success and wealth and youth, they are fully aware of the fleeting nature of life um, and that they will, too, die one day. Um, now, the somewhat odd form and placement of the skull, how it's sort of distorted um, and facing away from the worldly possessions towards the side of the painting, um, that's significant as well. So it faces towards a half-hidden crucifix that is positioned in the upper left corner. Um, and so this positioning is meant to affirm that these men believe their salvation um, and their eternal lives are dependent on the Christian God. Um, so the skull turns away from the earthly or the material, um, and it looks towards the eternal um, or everlasting afterlife through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Now, the skull here is made using a type of illusion called an anamorphosis. It really only looks naturalistic when the viewer stands uh, directly in front and to the right of the canvas. Um, perhaps the distortion maybe also reflects the unpredictability of death. Um, but overall, these symbolic objects and kind of positionings come together to really enhance the message or the content of the entire painting. The contextual analysis focuses on the world of the artwork or the context in which it was made. It looks at the making and viewing of the work within its original context. It looks at the atmosphere and the ideas, typically from a specific time and or culture, which the artwork both includes and reflects. So in a contextual analysis, you're going to go outside of the chosen work to find the answers about how to understand it. Um, how does the work express or shape the experiences, ideas, or values of the individuals or groups that made, used, viewed, or owned it? Now, there are several types or um, aspects of contextual analysis that you can emphasize um, and that you can use to decipher the meanings of the artwork. Now, as you've already seen, an iconographical analysis involves a bit of contextual information. However, we also have religious analysis, which considers the artwork in relation to the religious context in which it was made. Um, typically, this method involves identifying narratives, key symbols, and important figures. Um, we can also just have a historical or social analysis, which considers the historical events, uh, both past and present, and the ways in which they appear in the work. Um, for these, you can think in terms of the larger historical or societal framework of the artist's culture. Um, that could include gender relations, class distinctions, religious influences, political conditions, etc. 
even if the artist is unknown, these issues are still important to understand the context of the work's production and reception. Um, of course, we also have biographical analysis, which considers whether the artist's personal experiences and opinions may have affected the making or meaning of the work in some way. Um, but we also have other types of analysis as well. We can have psychological analysis that investigates the work through the consideration of the artist's state of mind or maybe based on important psychological studies or um, theories like those of Sigmund Freud or Carl Jung. We have feminist analysis, which considers the role of women in an artwork as the subjects, creators, patrons, and viewers. Um, a feminist analysis might reflect the intentions of an artist or maybe the perspectives of the viewer, the interpretations of the work, or maybe a combination of several of these ideas. Uh, similarly, gender studies analyses are sort of expanding those considerations that have already been raised by feminist analysis and exploring ways in which the work reflects the experience based on a person's gender. Um, queer theory, very similar. It explores um, ways of thinking that dismantle traditional assumptions about gender and sexuality um, and sexual identity. And um, the goal really of queer theory in art is to challenge the traditional academic approaches and kind of fight social inequality. Um, and we can also have critical race theory, uh, which interprets the work based on uh, a critical examination of society and culture as it interacts or intersects with race, power, and institutional practices. Um, and post-colonial theory is somewhat similar. It concerns Orientalism, European colonialism or imperialism, and multiculturalism and the ways in which colonized peoples have been and still are depicted. Um, so all of these different types of analysis kind of fall into the category of contextual analysis um, because they all relate to the ways in which you know, the society that the art was made in functioned or the ways that the artist who created the work perceived or um, understood the world around them, the ways in which they believed, etc. So let's return to this work of art, Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith Decapitating Halifernes from about 1620. Now, I know that we've already seen this um, in a few other lectures, but I want to return to it now because it's a great example of how a contextual analysis can help us to further understand the content and the meaning of a work of art. Um, so to refresh your memory, Artemisia Gentileschi is an Italian Baroque painter. Um, she was active in the 16th century, and she's one of the few female artists who um, were um, successful during this period. And so we've already looked at this particular work of art, and I kind of told you about the story that it was based on. Um, but to refresh your memory, let me let me just tell you again. So this was a popular story um, to be depicted by Renaissance and Baroque artists. Uh, Judith was a beautiful widow whose town, Bethula, was about to be attacked by the Assyrian army. Um, and so Judith uh, was so worried for her people's lives that she kind of takes their protection into their into her own hands. Um, she goes into the camp of the Assyrian army and there she is seen by the general Halifernes and he is so taken by her beauty that he invites her back to his tent um, for dinner and <clears throat> according to the narrative or to the original story um, he was so taken by her beauty that he drank far more wine than he had ever drank before in his life. And so after dinner, he drunkenly passes out. And at this point, Judith uh, seizes her opportunity and cuts off his head, ultimately saving her entire town and all of the people there. So this familiar narrative, um, Gentileschi has depicted it 
using directional lines and contrasting values to kind of draw us to the point of climax within the story. We've got bright light that emphasizes Judith's arms um, and those of her maidservant, which are visually connected to the sword itself. Um, and so as the arms stretch toward the dark values of the victim's head, we kind of follow along the implied lines that are created. The light values of the five bare arms create these strong directional lines that lead to the focal point where blood spurts from the violent attack on Holofernes' neck. And so this emphasis created through a contrast of values and directional line helps to um, focus our our gaze on the fatal blow, even though it's somewhat obscured by the dark shadow below the chin there. Now, the very powerful heroine that Gentileschi has depicted in Judith here, um, this has a very strong relationship with the events that occurred in the artist's own life. So, Artemisia Gentileschi was the victim of sexual assault. She was raped by her father's friend and a fellow artist named Augustino Tossi um, when she was 17 years old, I believe. Um, would have been prior to her creation of this particular canvas. But during the very public rape trial that followed, uh, Augustino Tassi claimed that Artemisia Gentileschi was not only a willing lover, but also quite promiscuous. Um, he implied that she had already been with many of the other men in the town and that he had done nothing that um, would further defile her because she was already defiled. Um, and so throughout this trial, it was it was very you know, traumatizing for her. She was placed on the stand and forced to recount her um, version of events. She described her struggle against Tossie and how she attempted to defend herself with a knife. Um, she also described how she felt betrayed by her female chaperone who had, um, uh, who had agreed to leave her alone with Tossie. Um, and so, Gentileschi and her father felt that in addition to the physical violence that she had suffered from the assault, their family name and their reputation had been attacked. Uh, they really feared that her prospects of marriage had been damaged by both the rape and the trial itself. Now, eventually, Tossi was found guilty and sentenced to exile, and Gentileschi did go on to marry another man, and she had five children. But knowing this contextual background really brings another layer of meaning to this particular artwork. Um, the depiction of Judith and her maidservant cutting off his head, cutting off the head of Halifernes, uh, this particular depiction was painted perhaps about a year after the, the um, rape trial was completed. Um, we have this very violent assault um, being committed by these two beautiful, brave women, kind of emphasizing their physical and, I think, mental and emotional strength here, um, showing how they have, you know, used their feminine wiles to seduce him and, and ultimately conquer him. Um, and so through feminist analysis, this painting has been interpreted as both an expression of the artist's anger at her own attacker and as a way of healing um, from the trauma of her own ordeal. Interestingly, Judith in, in Gentileschi's depictions of her often resembles Artemisia herself. Um, so there are self-portraits of her that can be compared to her depictions of Judith um, that show those similarities. And if we zoom in, notice that Judith is shown wearing this golden bracelet, um, which has these small, um, small little images set within. Uh, so 
This is actually a bracelet that features images of the goddess Artemis. She was the goddess of chastity and of the hunt. And she was also Artemisia Gentileschi's namesake. She was named after Artemis. And so the inclusion of this bracelet, I think, really um, ties the character of Judith to the um, personal experience of Gentileschi even further. She's sort of identifying as Judith here and expressing her own, um, her own rage and, you know, trying to get her own closure through this familiar story. And so without knowing the context in which she created this, it wouldn't have such a deep level of meaning. Now let's take this a step further and compare Artemisia Gentileschi's version with the version painted by another Italian artist, a male Italian artist named Caravaggio, um, just a few years prior. So Caravaggio was one of the most prominent Italian painters in the Baroque era, so in the 16th century. Um, his style was rather innovative, and um, he sort of inspired many other Baroque painters, including Artemisia Gentileschi. Um, so he tended to depict naturalistic, kind of down-to-earth versions of uh, scenes, often religious narratives or um, kind of well-known classical stories. Um, oftentimes his, his kind of frank realism offended viewers. They believed that religious figures and artworks should be idealized to symbolize their holiness rather than um, shown as being ordinary or everyday people. Um, but he was also, you know, very appreciated. He developed tenebrism, the use of extreme um, dark values to create kind of a dramatic, um, a dramatic scene. Um, and that was adopted by many other Baroque artists as well. Um, so Gentileschi here, her use of this extremely dark background and then the um, kind of highlighted foreground that makes the figures seem as if they're emerging from the shadows, that's something that she has kind of gotten from Caravaggio here. Now, Caravaggio's painting is depicting the same subject, the same scene, even the same moment of the scene that Gentileschi's uh, painting is depicting, the moment in which Judith and her maidservant are beheading the general Halifernes. However, just looking at them side by side here, they're quite different, right? Um, in Caravaggio's on the left, we have this strong beam of light that sort of stops time as Judith slices her knife through the general's neck. Um, the light really emphasizes the drama of the moment and kind of shows the main characteristics of Caravaggio's style. The scene really seems to emerge into the light from that darkened background, um, kind of like a modern spotlight. Um, and it also makes the scene look as if it takes place in this sort of shallow stage-like space, which again reinforces this kind of dramatic effect. Um, the details that Caravaggio has focused on, uh, for example, the, the 17th century clothing, these are meant to emphasize the ordinary aspects of this biblical event. You know, this is a this is a, a biblical event. It's somewhat um, religious, perhaps, but he's depicted these individuals as if they are, um, you know, no one special. They're just everyday people. Um, then with Gentileschi's, we see, you know, we see these similarities. However, she really infuses her image of Judith with this active physical strength. Um, and while, you know, while Car Caravaggio's Judith seems to be almost repulsed by the act she is performing, um, Gentileschi's Judith is very 
physically involved, as is the maid servant. They are exerting force on the man, um, holding him down so that they can remove his head with this blade. Um, there's this sense of danger, of urgency, um, this you know heightened emotion, but also this sort of determination in the women's faces and in their gestures. Um, really bringing a certain sense of agency back to the female characters here. Um, whereas Caravaggio's Judith, again, she sort of seems um, put off by what she's doing. She is standing apart from um, Palafernes. Her arms are extended and um, she does have rather muscular forearms, but she seems to be holding the knife rather delicately, almost as if she is grossed out um, by the act of cutting off this man's head, um, or maybe shocked by the fact that she is doing this. And then notice that Caravaggio's maidservant is an old woman who is not taking any active part in the murder, but rather she seems to be sort of whispering in the ear of the younger Judith. Uh, Gentileschi's servant, helps to physically restrain the general. Um, so comparing these two uh, depictions of the same subject and considering the context of Gentileschi's life and what her experience as a female and a female artist in this era would have been, that kind of helps us understand why she depicts it one way and he depicts it another way. Why hers is perhaps more um, emotionally effective, despite the similarities, um, because she has kind of a personal connection to the ideas that are being represented, ideas of um, women's oppression or of violence against women, and of kind of taking back um, her own sense of power. So hopefully this gives you a nice idea of how Contextual analyses can really help un, help us to understand the meaning or the, the content of the work further. Now, your chapter in your book um, includes several other examples of um, analyses on different works of art, so definitely read that chapter, and then I'll post some additional videos as well.